Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Mia Tata, member of the research team here at the People's Forum, which is a political and popular education space and movement incubator center based in New York City. Thank you again for joining us and we apologize for the delay. We are very excited to have both Andrew J. Douglas and Jared A. Loggins here today um, to present on their new book, The Prophet of Discontent, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Critique of Racial Capitalism, published by University of Georgia Press. This book seeks to re-examine the writings and speeches of Martin Luther King with a focus on his tendencies towards anti-capitalist analysis. They also use Cedric Robertson's Black Radical Tradition as a framework for reclaiming the often sanitized legacy of the Reverend Doctor. Andrew is a professor of political science and a faculty member in Africana Studies and International Comparative Labor Studies at Morehouse College, and he is also the author of In the Spirit of Critique, Thinking Politically in the Dialectical Tradition, and W.E.B. Du Bois and the Critique of the Competitive Society. Jared is an assistant professor of Black Studies and Political Science at Amherst College. This event is the third in a series of book talks that we are hosting this fall, and you can check out recordings of the last two on our YouTube page and RSV for our final one on November 4th through our website at thepeoplesforum.org. Finally, you can get copies of Prophet of Discontent online or in person at our bookstore, 1804 Books. And with that, I will pass it off to Andrew and Jared to begin this discussion. Great. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? I hope so. All right. Um, th this is a great opportunity. I really want to thank the People's Forum for hosting this event and this book series this fall. Um, such an honor for Jared and, and I to be here. Um, we have about 20, 25 minutes uh, to talk about the book before we turn it over to Q&A. And Jared and I thought that it would be most productive if he and I just sort of have a back and forth conversation with one another. And so to start things off, I'm going to kick it over to Jared just to kind of set the scene and begin with a discussion of an anecdote that we use, a conversation that King had in, uh, in 1968, um, uh, just to sort of get set the scene and, and to get us started a bit. So Jared, you want to talk about that? Uh, so first of all, thank you uh, to the People's Forum for 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 having us. Um, so a, a week before uh, King is is killed in in Memphis, um, he's joined in uh, New York in the New York City apartment of uh, Harry Belafonte. Um, there also is Stanley Levinson, uh, Andrew Young, uh, and uh, and some other confidants. Earlier in the in in that day. Uh, King um, is uh, was in New, New Jersey uh, with the Mary Baraka, and they had been talking about um, the rebellion that seemed to be impending uh, there. There had been a series of of rebellions around around the country, um, and uh, and it seemed that things were teetering on the brink in in Newark. And that evening, uh, in Belafonte's apartment. King uh, sort of uh, essentially says to his confidants that, that, that what was unfolding in Newark, the conditions that, that Black people uh, in, the, in, the, in the city were living under uh, were absolutely horrifying. And he says to, he confides to his confidants um, that he wholly embraces what they feel. Um, that he says, I have more in common with these young people than with anybody else in the in the movement. I feel their rage, I feel their pain, I feel their frustration. It's the system that is the problem. And it's, it's choking the breath out of their lives. And it's Andrew Young, um, uh, of, all, of all people, the future US Congressman and, and ambassador to the United Nations, who, who really unsettles King. He says to, to, to King and, and to, the, to the group gathered that evening, I don't know, Martin, it's not the entire system. It's only part of it. And I think we can fix that. King wasn't having it uh, that, 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 that night. And, and again, the, what, what was unfolding in, in Newark had, had clearly gone to him. And he tells, uh, he tells uh, Andy Young, you're, not a, you're a capitalist and, I, and I'm not. The trouble is that we live in a failed system. Capitalism does not permit an even flow of economic resources. 
With this system, a small privileged few are rich beyond conscience. And almost all others, almost all others are doomed to, to be poor at some level. That's the way the system works. And since we know that the system will not change the rules, we're going to have to change the system. I think it's a, it's a, it's a monumental moment because it reveals so much about, about, about King's critique of capitalism, about his relationship to rebellion and nonviolence. And so I wonder if we can kind of um, open here, kind of think about what are the sort of implications of, of this moment and what is King trying to, trying to communicate? Right, so, you know, it's a conversation that could happen, that is happening today. Uh, and, you know, some of the language that contemporary scholars and organizers are using today to wrestle with precisely what King is wrestling with is the language of racial capitalism, which is a language that King did not have a conceptual framework that he did not necessarily have at his disposal during his time period. And what this book attempts to do is draw on contemporary discourse on racial capitalism as a kind of lens through which to reassess King's critical theory of capitalist society. Um, by now, uh, it's pretty well known that King was a fierce critic of capitalism, that he was a committed democratic socialist, uh, that he was a fierce critic of imperialism and militarism, and of course, a fierce critic of systematic racism, systemic racism. Uh, and, you know, the radical King, you know, Cornel West, Michael Honey, so many other scholars have published works in recent years that have done much to kind of recover the radical, the real King, from this sort of sanitized neoliberal version that we've grown accustomed to over the last 30 or so years. Um, and what we're trying to do as political theorists uh, is sort of reconstruct the critical theory, some of the theoretical presuppositions that his egalitarian vision presupposes, that his critiques of capitalism and imperialism and racism presuppose. He was, of course, a very prominent public speaker and was often speaking in an idiom and in settings where he didn't necessarily have an opportunity to really mine some of the theoretical underpinnings of his position. And so what, what we've done with this book is uh, you know, draw on our strength as political theorists to try to reconstruct some of that implicit uh, theoretical um, uh, you know, underpinnings there, uh, again, using this contemporary language of, of racial capitalism. And uh, the central question of the book really turns on a phrase that King used uh, pretty frequently in his later years mm -hmm. uh, that he called repeatedly for a radical revolution of values. Uh, and what we try to do in the book is think about what King's call for a radical revolution of values, how that is complicated by the production and circulation of value under capitalism. King, of course, knew that you can't just transform, that we can't just think about valuing one another in new and different ways. We can't just say we're going to value one another, we're going to value Black lives, and suddenly that happens. We find ourselves embedded in a structural environment uh, that prevents our ability to act on our um, you know, visions of a, of a better world. Mm -hmm. As King would put it, a society that values people rather than things, right? A person-oriented society rather than a thing-oriented society. Mm -hmm. Well, we live in a thing-oriented society in which everything is commodified, in which ra uh, you know, um, racial value is sort of worked into that uh, commodification and production and circulation and accumulation of capital. And so we're trying to mine all of that. Uh, and so, you know, Jared, if I could kick it back to you, maybe to say a bit more about, um, you know, how we understand that theory of racial capitalism mm -hmm. that we're uh, sort of employing in this analysis. So, um, so, so King makes these interesting uh, pr pronouncements about, about, about post-war capitalist society. Um, he says, for example, that all around him, uh, the, there is evidence that we still live in slavery. Um, and this slavery is covered up by certain niceties of complexity. That's a formulation um, that's taken there from uh, Trump, the trumpet of conscience. 
And he also uh, says that the ultimate logic of racism is, is genocide. Both of these uh, formulations um, we sort of want to suggest uh, invite reflection about about the logic of what of what it is uh, of what is being called racial racial capitalism. Uh, racial capitalism, of course, uh, has sort of analytical and historical registers, though though our focus in the book um, uh, draws more heavily on on the analytical. We can talk in the Q and A, of course, about about these sort of historical registers and and so forth. But the, the, the key figure anyway on the sort of historical side is, is, uh, is Cedric Robinson. There are of course other folks who are kind of thinking about the relationship between race and capitalism. Um, uh, folks like uh, Peter James Husson and Sharice Burton Staley have been thinking about how, how do we expand racial capitalism beyond, beyond Cedric Robinson? I think it's a, it's a, it's a good question to, to ask. Um, but we lean on, on Cedric Robinson um, and he, he argues uh, in the in the first part of, part of that book, essentially uh, that there were no capitalist societies um, in Western Europe or on a more global scale that were ever fully divorced uh, from practices of racial division uh, and, and domination. Uh, the point that that Robinson is really trying to drive home uh, is that historically, uh, uh, European racialism, the reproduction of difference internal to to Europe to, to Western Europe. Um, develops alongside the commodification of, of labor of, of labor power. Analytically, this suggests that capital accumulation requires loss, disposability, and the differentiation of human value. That's a formulation there from from Jody Melamed. And other folks have kind of been thinking thinking in, in these terms as well, uh, like Ruthie Gilmore. Um, King never 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 makes the the point as sharply as 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 his counterpart Malcolm X did on this point um who said that we cannot have capitalism without racism Jing is a, a powerful formulation but King never sort of uh states it in, in just in just that in just that way nevertheless what we try and do in the book is to show that throughout throughout King's uh reflections on the the quote unquote structure of society and, and as he calls it, the total pattern of, of, of economic exploitation. This all suggests that the capital, capitalism's racial politics uh, or, or, or what we might call um, uh, barring, referring to uh, Mbembe, capitalism's necropolitics is to say that there is a kind of death dealing at the heart of, of, of capitalism and it pursues essentially racial directions. Recall the formulation again, right? We still have slavery covered up by certain niceties of complexity. What King is, is partly drawing our attention to in that formulation is, is what Michael Dawson has called the hidden abode of race, certain covered, covered up by certain niceties of complexity, which is to say that the insidious ways in which the logic of superior and inferior humans is reproduced um, is, is seen as necessary for, uh, for slavery, theft, colonialism, theft of land, expropriation, and so forth, dispossession. And we suggest that King, that what King is doing is he's raising these points about slavery and genocide to effectively argue that racism uh, enshrines the inequalities that capitalism requires as a matter of course. To understand racism in this way is to unsettle ideas about 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 racism as as an as an affliction, uh, as taking on a life of its own, um, as a national disease, right? Like we hear all these these sort of mystifications about 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 racism, and and King wants to want, wants to say um, uh, that that, uh, that that racism really is a kind of pattern of social relations. It emerges, as Adolf Reed says, under specific historical circumstances, conditions of law, state, class relations, right? And, and so one upshot of this approach is that it moves, it's, it's an, this is an attempt to move us beyond this sort of race versus class uh, impasse that, that captures so much of contemporary discourse uh, about, about capitalism. Um, anyway, that's sort of the the kind of the kind of big picture sort of analytical story that we're trying to tell about 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 King. 
Yeah, absolutely. That was thanks for that, Jared. I, it, just one other thing I'll add to this before I'll say something more about how we sort of use Cedric Robinson's work to kind of frame frame the book. Uh, we do spend some time thinking about um, you know King's critique of imperialism, mm -hmm. right? And of course, 1967, a year to the day before he's killed in in Memphis, he gives his famous anti-Vietnam War speech and, and sort of comes out against the war. And, you know, his, his anti-militarism is often framed on sort of ethical grounds as a proponent of nonviolence. Um, if we get into the kind of political economic underpinnings of his critique of imperialism and war making, it's often sort of framed as kind of opportunity costs, like we can't invest in the great society at home and work to eradicate poverty at home because too many national resources are going to fight in wars overseas. You know, we argue that that's sort of a misreading uh, of, you know, the larger point, which is that this is very much uh, part of King's um, uh, sort of evolving critique of capitalist imperialism and his understanding of capitalism as a global system and the ways in which the war making uh, that the United States and other great powers in the world capitalist system are involved in is part and parcel of a regime of accumulation, efforts to exploit uh, labors, expropriate lands, get access to markets. All of that is racialized and he understands all of this quite vividly really um, and so we we use this sort of you know framework to kind of foreground you know his his political economy to bring some of these aspects of his work to light, offer a slightly different kind of take than we are perhaps accustomed to on on various aspects of King's work, including uh, his his um, anti imperialism. Uh, let me just say one other thing too about Cedric Robinson. So as Jared mentioned, Cedric Robinson. Uh, is sort of a, the work of Cedric Robinson is, is very much sort of a frame for this book, both in terms of the sort of, you know, of racial capitalism, but also in terms of this idea of a black radical tradition. Mm -hmm. Throughout the book, we uh, work to situate uh, King in a black radical tradition as Cedric Robinson articulates that. Uh, and this has a number of you know, this brings a number of things to the surface. Uh, one is it helps uh, to push back against sort of familiar narratives that there's certainly plenty of truth to this familiar narrative that, you know, uh, of a sort of leadership sort of account of King and the civil rights movement and the black freedom struggle in, in, in King's time period. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to kind of uh, think about how, you know, he was pushed to the to the forefront, so to speak, um, by a popular movement, by the black working class, uh, that you know, his thinking evolved as a result of engaging with the black working class, engaging with, for example, uh, uh, you know, organizers like Johnny Tillman and the National Welfare Rights Organization, that mm -hmm. is thinking about um, sort of state-managed capitalism and the welfare state and the nature of capitalism's reproduction of and dependence upon uh, unwaged reproductive, social reproductive work. Uh, you know, he's listening to organizers on the ground and to ordinary folks on the ground, and that's really shaping uh, his analysis in some interesting ways. And so we, we read all of that as sort of evidence or a testament of the ways in which King is reflective of a black radical tradition as Cedric Robinson. Can I, can I jump in here too? There's a, so there's this, um, there's the, 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 the sort of, uh, the bit in, in Cedric Robinson's 97 book, uh, Black Movements in America, where he kind of, where he kind of, he, I think he really is trying to situate King in the, in the black radical tradition here. And I want to sort of, I want to read that and Good. Yeah. we can, we can talk Great. about it. Um, and I'm not going to read the read, read the whole thing. Um, I'll start with um, um, uh, he says Baker and others. He's referring to Ella Baker. Uh, Baker and others whose genius rested in organization and the analyses of, of social process recognized both King's unquestioned authority and his uh, obvious limitations. Baker was appalled by the other SCLC leaders' uh, deference to and dependency on King, but they too were hedged in by the prescriptive narrative of black salvationism. Thus, while a Baker or an Abernathy 
or a clerk might provide organizational uh, uh, integument, that is practical planning and realistic goals to King's paradigmatic talk, the power of the movement came from the masses, from a century or two of their ancestors under acute distress, elaborating a vision of the future and how it might be attained. In King, and this is, this is really powerful to me, in King, they saw their own reflection, not their master, their own ambitions, not his dictates. I mean, there, there it is, right? This is, this, is, this is Robinson trying to challenge these sort of, this kind of great man, kind of hero thesis um, that has sort of engulfed King. And he wants to say that part of what it means for King to be in the black radical tradition is to say that he is deeply embedded in the struggles of the, of, of, of the people, of the masses. That he's not some uh, some sort of like thought leader, <laughs> who uh, who sort of is merely just trying to kind of play on this sort of entrepreneurial spirit and to sort of put his ideas out there. But he really is sort of connected to the struggle of the people. Indeed, yeah. And just one other, very quickly on on Robinson, you know, in in that the famous book, 1983 book, Black Marxism: The Making of the Black Radical Tradition, when he finally, when Robinson finally gets around to kind of articulating the nature of the Black Radical Tradition, so much of it hinges on a, a rejection or an aversion to violence, right? Which resonates with King in so many ways, right? And it's not just sort of um, sort of willful ethical choices to resist violence as a tactic or a strategy as part of a protest movement but it's an analysis of the violence built into the institutional structures of Western civilization, including fundamentally the institution of private property ownership, right? And so we spend some time sort of thinking about how, you know, King's commitments to nonviolence as part of a black radical tradition um, really necessarily imply a fundamental rejection of the institution of private property ownership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are, I, th I think, maybe two other, I, I don't know how we're doing on time before we kind of open it up to Q&A, but there are maybe two other things that I'd, I'd like to sort of get us to reflect on, Jared. One is, um, you know, we have a chapter where we talk about King's sort of ambivalent um, thinking about the state mm -hmm. um, and how that kind of uh, gets vivified or comes alive in a way when we foreground his sort of critique of capitalism. And so I don't know if you want to maybe talk about that or maybe I can talk about that. And the other piece is um, we have a concluding chapter where we sort of pick up in 68 uh, with what happens right after King's death with efforts to kind of build an institutional framework that can carry on King's critique of capitalism. And so for us, that means sort of foregrounding the work of the Institute of the Black World that was founded in Atlanta in late 1969 by Vincent Harding and a cadre of others who were associated with, with this. Maybe let's jump to that, Jared, uh, the IBW. Okay. And then if in the Q&A, we can talk about can talk the about, political okay. and state. Um, if it comes up, we can address that. That's good. That's good. Um, so, so... So the point of the final chapter of, of, of the book, this, this chapter five, um, in thinking about the uh, IBW, the Institute of the Black World, uh, is to really sort of pose this question about, um, you know, where do, uh, where do we house uh, King's radical critique? Where can it, where can it live on? And that's a question that's sort of being asked uh, among 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 King's uh, uh, contemporaries and, and folks and his confidants. Uh, in the in the aftermath of of his assassination, there is initially a sense uh, that maybe King's uh, uh, critique, his sort of radical critique, can uh, could find a home uh, in uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Memorial Center. And almost immediately, uh, Vincent Harding, who is really kind of one of the sort of leading figures, who's sort of one of the figures leading the charge. Uh, for carrying on King's radical legacy, um, there is already a kind of tension about that. The King Center wants to sort of pursue a sort of uh, conciliatory kind of approach to thinking about, uh, uh, almost sort of colorblind approach to thinking about King and, and, and his legacy. Uh, and some of that has to do with um, sort of hedging, um, uh, hedging in terms of philanthropy and trying to keep the money coming in, so to speak. And Harding kind of wants to go in a different direction. He kind of wants to continue that kind of radical edge that we 
that we really start to see in a more sophisticated way toward the end of uh, toward the end of, of, of King's life. Um, and so, uh, so was born the Institute of the Black World. It was uh, uh, meant to be a, a place where a kind of black radical counter public could, could unfold. And it was a place where uh, radical scholars uh, could come and sort of talk about the issues uh, affecting uh, black, black, black communities and neighborhoods. And some folks who kind of, just to give you a sense of, of, of folks who kind of uh, came to the, the to the center, uh, to the to the institute, um, folks like um, uh, 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 James and Grace Grace Lee Boggs, Ella Baker. Catherine Dunham, St. Clair Drake, Walter Rodney, C.L.R. James. These are all people who kind of appeared there. And the point was really to kind of build a, 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 a space of what, um, what Fred Moten and, 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 and Stefan Harney called Black study. But, but almost uh, immediately, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Institute kind of faces these like funding pressures um, these pressures to sort of conform to uh, to whitewash uh, the, the the kind of the, the kind of study that they were doing, and so what we're trying to do in this in this in this 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 chapter is to raise questions about what does it mean uh, to pursue um, black study in the face of these um, these sort of monumental massive institutional pressures, whether it be philanthropy or in, in the uh, or, or the university. And so something that we kind of talk about uh, in the uh, at, at length in the book is about the possibility of third worlding the university as a way of trying to uh, as a way of trying to um, uh, make good on the on the sort of radical promise of black study, which is emancipation, which is black freedom. The, the, the IBW ultimately uh, kind of falls short. That has something to do with um, uh, state repression. They're being surveilled. It has, it has something to do with philanthropy um, and the sort of pulling pulling away of, of, of funding from the organization, internal conflict. Um, I should say here uh, that Derek White, um, uh, the challenge of uh, his book, The Challenge of Blackness, really kind of spells out some of the, the, the challenges in more detail uh, than we do uh, than we do in the in the in the book. But the point really is to sort of think about uh, the deep and sort of profound challenge that institutions, institutional logics pose uh, to the practice of 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 emancipatory critique. Um, and that is very much in the spirit of uh, I think of what it means to kind of bring about a sort of a revolution of value. It's not an easy thing, it requires sacrifice. Um, it requires a fundamental rethinking of the relationship between study and institutions. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to put it sort of in, in King's idiom, I mean, the challenge is how do you build the beloved community from within the confines of the racial capitalist world order? Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you build institutions that facilitate uh, the mode of being, um, the type of social relations that we would associate with what King calls in a very speculative register, the beloved community? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you do that when, you know, just to keep the lights on is to participate in the reproduction of a racial capitalist, extractive, exploitative uh, you know, uh, uh, economic and political regime, mm -hmm. right? And so these are contradictions that King, of course, was wrestling with, um, became more amplified in the last years of his life. There are some really interesting reflections that he offers in some of his commentary to his SCLC staff about, um, you know, the challenges involved in sort of maintaining an institution that can sort of do, do the work uh, and really sort of challenge the, those structures. Uh, and then, of course, with the IBW. Right. Uh, and these are contradictions and challenges that have only gotten more, um, you know, ch more challenging into our own time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll just read if I could. I mean, on the beloved community, 
you know, we really do uh, sort of building on, you know, Moten and Harney's notion of black study. They describe it this way. And I'm just going to read this quote because we think it's it resonates quite nicely with what King called the beloved community. We are committed, Moten says, to the idea that study is what you do with other people. It's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. Mm -hmm. The notion of a rehearsal, being in a kind of workshop, playing in a band, in a jam session, or old men sitting on a porch, or people working together in a factory. There are these various modes of activity. The point of it calling it study is to mark the incessant and irreversible intellectuality of these activities that is already present. Now, in some of his later works, King is trying to think about how it is that we could move away from a political economy that commodifies labor and goods and services such that we could get in a point where you could meaningfully compensate people such that they could reasonably live their life simply by, as he put it at one point, reading a book and walking around the neighborhood and talking to people in the neighborhood about that book. That's right. Right. And so what we take this to mean is that he's thinking really imaginatively here about how we could break down some of these institutional structures of racial capitalism that make that kind of speculative behavior, whether we call it the beloved community, we call it study, whatever we want to call it, make that a dead end in terms of earning a living and being able to put food on your table. Mm -hmm. to a, a kind of mode of being that can actually sustain a community materially, mm -hmm. right? a world that can value that kind of contribution uh, to social engagement. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and I think the, 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 the sort of uh, the very idea of black study is also put, is, it also wants to push back against the sort of necropolitical dimensions of, uh, of 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 capitalist society, right? Is it gestures to life? It gestures to uh, a, a critique that is about kind of building, fortifying a world that sustains that sustains life. Um, and and I, and perhaps we can kind of talk in the Q and A too about the 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 relationship between this sort of beloved community uh, and the sort of theological resonance of the beloved community because it is it is about a kind of uh, about uh, about affirming 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 life, and I like what you said too about the the sort of um, the the improvisational when you're sort of reading uh, sort of uh, Modi's uh, Moton's formulation there about the sort of pro improvisational character of, of of black study. I mean, there is a question about whether this kind of improvisation. So, what does it mean? What is it? In what ways do institutions kind of constrain this, this kind of improv improvisation in favor of a kind of root, uh, a, a sort of routinized sort of understanding of, of, of knowledge production that wants to reproduce sort of numbers and figures and measurements rather than actually be about something deeper um, and more liberating. Great, with that, I think we'll Pivot to the Q and A portion. Thank you so much, Jordan. And it was um, having read the book, it's still great to sort of like hear you guys talking about it and hear it in sort of the form of dialogue between the co-authors is, is really exciting. Um, my first question is sort of just like what sort of personally, what sort of threads of study or areas of study do you both come from? Um, and what sort of conditions, or maybe what conditions of the world sort of inspired you to revisit King's legacy in this way and from this perspective? Well, we are both, do you want me to take that one, Jared, or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, you, you can go first. I, All right, I mean, we're both political theorists, um, but of course, political theory is a very um, multidisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary um, sort of field of study. Uh, and, you know, this project has some real roots at Morehouse College, where I teach. Uh, once upon a time, Jared was a student there. Um, of course, it's the alma mater of Martin Luther King. We have a portion of the King um, papers uh, uh, there at the college. Uh, and this book is part of a series at the University of Georgia Press uh, called the Morehouse College King Collection Series on Civil and Human Rights. 
And, you know, this, we don't need to get into the details necessarily of how the book emerged, but it really is sort of an occasional piece that, that we wanted to contribute something to this series. And we, we were thinking about what we could say about King that was new, that was different, that drew on our um, sort of skills and background in political theory. There's a lot of work done on King, uh, you know, his theology, his religious commitments, a lot of work done on King from the perspective of historians not so much work done from the perspective of political theory or critical theory. Uh, and so that's where we sort of saw an opening to get in here uh, and to distill his thinking uh, down to some conceptual essences in some, some new and we hope generative ways. Jared, do you want to add anything? Yeah. I mean, I would also say that, um, that, 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 that the, the co-authoring has also kind of been an opportunity to sort of enact the kind of study uh, that we, that we uh, that, that that we elaborate in in in, in the book, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that that you know we I was once upon a time a student at at Morehouse, and this was the kind of thing that that you and I kind of did, and it was sort of commonplace to kind of uh, to do this do this sort of thing. I mean, one challenge is uh, if I if I may say, is that the sort of the the sort of neoliberalization of of institutions makes this kind of this this kind of studying this kind of collective scholarship uh, increasingly uh, uh, difficult and um, and uh, uh, and challenging to 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 do um, because it's not right it's not bringing in the 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 institutional dollars it's not attracting the donors and so it's not the kind it's the kind of thing that um, that that administration at uh, many institutions balk at. Um, so there is a kind of there is a kind of um, sort of uh, investment there. I will also say that for me, um, my sort of political consciousness um, uh, really owes a great deal to um, uh, the the, uh, the 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 state sanction killing of Troy Davis uh, several years ago. I. Um, was a student on campus, and I remember sort of at posing these questions about, you know, why why has this happened, and and why is why is it that um, that, that that black and brown people um, are subjected to this to this to this kind of thing on a routine basis? Uh, I remember feeling despair, um, and I think for me that was a kind of an entry point to to sort of thinking about these sort of deeper and more fundamental questions about the structure of a society that necessitates this kind of, of, of death, that reproduces this kind of death. Um, and the other, the, and, and finally, I, 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 should, I should say too that, you know, we, fin we completed this book um, uh, in, the, in the middle of the, the, the uprisings last summer. And so it was kind of a profound, the book, sort of a profound, I think, in some ways, a, a, just a love letter to folks who are struggling on the ground to say mm -hmm. that, that, that there are ancestors on whom uh, they might draw and the, and the ancestors on whom they might draw is ever expanding. And King certainly is among them. Um, he was very clear in, 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 in his diagnosis. Uh, he was very clear in Sort of uh, being in concert and solidarity with with the with the working class and people struggling against the violence of 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 the state. Thank you. Um, and we have a question here from Quentin, um, and it is, I'm wondering how King placed the black working class in relation to the necessities of the state. What were their obligations as individuals to the capitalist? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, we have a we have a chapter of the book um, where we uh, really try to think about King's orientation toward the state, and it's an orientation that is marked by a, a fairly profound ambivalence. Um, you know, this entire book is is sort of looking at King's foregrounding King's critique of capitalism. And so mm -hmm. we're looking at political economy and we're thinking about the state, just, you know, we're thinking about everything in the book in relation to, you know, how it sort of factors into King's critique of capitalism. Uh, and in regards to the state, 
you know, King was, of course, a strong supporter of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. what we might think of as sort of state-managed capitalism, that he wanted to expand the regulatory capacity and the provisioning capacity of the state to kind of offset the excesses of, um, you know, capitalist inequality and exploitation. Uh, but um, we, we try to recover sort of a more complicated orientation that he has toward the state and toward what we call the political more broadly, again, drawing on the work of Cedric Robinson, that his, he always also understood the state as anti-Black, white supremacist, violent to its core. I mean, that's the only model of the contemporary or modern nation state that we've ever known. It has been set up to serve the needs of capital and the needs of white supremacism. What's that, uh, the formulation, uh, the greatest purveyor of, of violence in the world today is my own is government. my own government. Absolutely, right? So he, he understood this, right? He, he, and, and he knew full well that you could never really wrestle the state as a form away from that violence, right? And that sort of service of private capital, right? Uh, and so what that meant for him was that what he was really interested in was the beloved community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we pick up, again, uh, drawing on Cedric Robinson's work for those who are, are, are sort of you know Robinson's work well, his first book where he sort of outlines this idea of the political and an anti-political that then becomes sort of associated with that black radical tradition that he's thinking with. Uh, and we suggest that that strand is there in, in King's work as well. Mm -hmm. um, that he has sort of one foot in a conventional political framing where he is sort of trying to make the nation state more democratically accountable to a, a black working class, certainly. Um, but always qualifying that with the idea that the political uh, and the state sort of form is never the ultimate answer uh, and that the beloved community sort of exceeds that. Um, so I don't know if that addresses the question um, very directly, um, Jared. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna uh, raise this point about, you know, in in terms of order. I mean, what is what is what does Robinson sort of propose uh, in place of this sort of political tradition? He proposes an anti-political tradition. Mm -hmm. That is a kind of a kind of tradition that is that wants to uh, move beyond the sort of reproduction of, of violence, which is which is endemic. Uh, to uh, to the state, but at the same time, I mean, you know, when we talk about you know when we talk about King's ambivalence, he kind of there's a, the other side of it too, of course, right? Um, he says in a in a in a in a in a in a sermon, for example, the fact that black men govern states, are building democratic institutions, sit in world tribunals, and participate in global decision making gives every negro gives every negro a needed sense of dignity. So he's like. He's like back and forth between this sort of point about, you know, the, the U.S. government being the greatest purveyor of violence and then also saying um, that that it is it is the government. It is black. It is the, the, the fact that black men govern states can give the, the Negro a sense of dignity. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes back and forth there. And that just sort of highlights his his ambivalence. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, it suggests. Uh, that that the king uh, sees the, the the state in some ways as a kind of pragmatic, as a kind of in a kind of as a kind of pragmatic necessity, that he's trying to make sense of how how it is to sort of uh, um, uh, 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 to 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 put uh, black people in a position of sort of experiencing a human flourishing and not being subject to to violence to racial violence and so forth. Um, but again, that beloved community, as you as you point out, is sort of it's speculative. Mm -hmm. There is no there is no no precedent for it. It's always a kind of gesturing forward, and in some ways, that this this kind of speculative dimension has has something to do with with uh, with his theological uh, with his theological commitments mm -hmm. and his faith. He's never he's never settled. Right with the with the with the condition with the wisdom of the world. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then, I think um, we want to respect everybody's time, so I have one more question. Um, this is my question again, just because of my personal curiosity. But um, um, so 
when you, I think when we think of an anti-capitalist analysis, people think of, of Marx and think of Marxism as um, one of the most thorough critiques of capitalism. Um, and so I'm wondering, and, and then Cedric Robinson often talks a lot about what he sees as some limitations of Marxism. Uh, and so I'm wondering um, if you could just sort of elucidate for viewers, um, where can we locate Marxism in Martin Luther King's work, um, his legacy, um, and then this is sort of a two-part question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do young people today who are organizing against capital structures with, with much more clarity than I think than before about it being against this capitalist system, um, how do they use Martin Luther King to revitalize or reorient their struggles um, today? Yeah, so um, you know, Marx appears in this book more frequently than most uh, readers of King would be comfortable with. There's no question <laughs> about that. You know, and um, but it's a modified Marxism, as you know, Fanon would put it. Or um, you know, we're building on sort of Cedric Robinson again. It's it's a, a Marx. It, it, you know, it's an anti-capitalism that is broadly sympathetic with Marxism, but mindful of the Eurocentric limitations of the conventional Marxist paradigm. Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, one of the things that we do in the book as theorists is we, we don't jump past the critique of capital to scrutinize the class politics, which is what so many sort of folks working politically in the Marxist tradition do, uh, that they take the critique of capital for granted and sort of jump ahead to the class politics, right? And then you get into these questions of class reductionism, where does race right. sort of factor into that, you know? And we don't have to do that. That's the point that, right. Yeah, I mean, we, we back up to sort of think um, both with and beyond Marx about the value form uh, that, it, you know, that is capital, the ways in which we're uh, sort of held into social relations with one another by virtue of how we uh, participate in this capitalist value form. And so thinking about it in that way, I think opens up, um, you know, some, some areas for convergence between Marx's analysis of capitalism, uh, its accumulative logic, uh, its sort of the competitive market relations, um, private ownership of the means of production, um, in ways that allow us to think about how uh, inequalities of various sorts are both required and reproduced in order for capital to reproduce itself. Uh, and that uh, provides an opening for thinking about how race, and this gets us in now to Cedric Robinson and the racial capitalism thesis, mm -hmm. you know, how racism, again, to draw on Gilmore's language, sort of enshrines the inequalities that capitalism requires. And so, you know, from our perspective, um, th there's maybe more room for uh, a kind of productive um, uh, convergence between uh, you know, aspects of Marx's analysis and the kind of critique of racial capitalism that we see in, uh, in, in King's, uh, sort of implicit in King's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just as a, as a kind of anecdotal point here too, I mean, King, King uh, read Capital uh, as a as a student at, at, at <laughs> 1949. So he claims by yeah, or himself. So, or so, or so he yeah, right, um, right. But I mean, so much of that is clouded, of course, by this sort of uh, hysteria of Cold War. Um, you know, the red baiting and all that that he got swept up in. You know, from his time you know, at Highlander Center, Highlander Folk School and, and so forth. And um, mm -hmm. so it, you know, it makes for uh, some really complicated kind of excavation work uh, that we have to do and reproductive work that we have to do to kind of read beyond sort of those outward pronouncements, the, you know, ardent, you know, I'm not a Marxist, I'm not a communist sort of projections that he makes right. uh, to kind of reading what his um, approach, kind of what kind of theoretical commitments and presuppositions his approach requires. Yeah. Well, that was the second part of the of, of, of right. Yeah. yeah, what was that second part of the question? Just um, for young people today who are more explicitly organizing against capitalism, being very clear that, that these two things connected, um, raising capitalism so it can't be 
can't be separated and can't be contained against as one sort of over the other. What what would you want them to take away from this new perspective of youth work? Mm-hmm. Racism and capitalism are, are deeply entangled, deeply entangled. And so what this means for, for, for organizing um, is, that, uh, is, that, is, that, is that folks have to kind of see the struggle um, against, against capitalism, the struggle for um, a genuinely better material world um, as entangled uh, with, with anti-racism. It cannot be, cannot imagine them as 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 uh, as as a delinked, they are absolutely uh, uh, integral. So anti-racism and an anti-capitalism have to be brought together in terms of organizing. And the other thing to to, to sort of say about, about about this too is um, that there are organizers who who think in just this way. Um, think of of abolitionist uh, organizers, or organizations like Critical Resistance, organizations all around the the the, the country who are thinking about. Um, you know, was responding to the, the the carceral or trying to combat the carceral state, undo the carceral state, uh, or whether uh, uh, it's uh, uh, addressing the uh, housing or whatever whatever issue. There are organizers who are thinking about the kind of interrelatedness uh, between uh, between capitalism uh, and and racism, and thinking about the ways. Um, that capitalism is necessarily necropolitical in ways that it, that pursue essentially racial essentially racial directions, and so that has been a kind of point of of of, of organizing for for a lot of folks. And I think I think young people should just uh, should tap into organizations like uh, that are that are doing that kind of work. There are so many um, uh, all over the place who are uh, who are struggling in this way. Andrew. I don't know that I have much more to add. I'm, I'm mindful of time. Um, Samaya? Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jen Andrew, for this great book. Um, and once again, for everybody watching, you can purchase a copy of this book um, at 1804books um, uh, online at 1804books.com or at the People's Forum, which is based in New York City. Um, Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Jared and Andrew, for um, donating your time for this event. Um, and thank you, everybody. And I hope you have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you.